Hello and welcome to the RS Fix. My name is Kyle and today I have my friend Tommy Breedlove with us. Uh, Tommy went into the military, was with 82nd Airborne Division, went on to also be with Blackwater for a while and uh, we're going to talk about exciting things and uh, yeah, stuff along those lines. Tommy, dude, it's awesome having That's you amazing. here, man. It's been, what, a year, year and a half, somewhere like that? Yeah, since I've seen you here, yeah. About a year it's been a hot say. minute, hot well, minute. Probably more like a year, I think. Yeah. So what have you been up to? Well, I've been working with uh, the woodworking and um, antler designs I do, antler chandeliers and things like that. But uh, Breed Love Designs, I have a company there here you go. in Ozark, Missouri. The shameless plug. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's awesome. So very cool. How long have you been doing that? Well, let's see. Uh, I guess about five years now. Maybe a little bit more. Awesome. You enjoy then? Yeah. Working with your hands. Yeah. Getting the artistic flair out there. It gets lonely. I'm at the house. I got a barn right behind the house. Um, so I'm by myself all the time. Yeah. But probably a little bit more than five years, I guess. Was that preferred for you? It was for a while, but I prefer to be around other veterans and, you know, I'm, I'm looking to get back into contracting, I think, right now for a little bit, off and Interesting. on. So, right on. We talked about that earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very cool. Well, uh, so let's, let's just starting off right off the bat, uh, what got you in the military? What made you think about it? When did that first come up? Well, I was mad at my dad, actually. <laughs> and, uh, he was in Vietnam. He was field artillery in Vietnam. And some of this I'm talking about is I didn't know what all this meant when he was telling me this when I was, I went in when I was 21. I didn't know what it was. You know, I just knew airborne. He was airborne. Uh, so cool. So, um, I was mad at him for one reason or another. I can't even remember why. So I went to a recruiter and joined the military and, uh, I told him I didn't, I didn't even know what it was, but I knew the movie Platoon. You seen that? Yep. I said, I want to do what those guys do, but I want to be airborne too. So, um, I don't know what draw me to that. The suck, I guess. If you're military, you know what that meant. Yeah. But uh, that was it. So, I joined the military and I wanted infantry and I wanted airborne. So, yeah. Well, it's, it's always amazing things like that where... You don't even remember the <laughs> the defining moment. Well, it's such a big decision. It was it was before nine eleven. It was in uh, February of two thousand, and uh, I didn't do it for anybody. Didn't do it for everybody. No, I did it for America. Or I did it for me, really. But uh, yeah, so nice. So what were you like in school? Horrible. Horrible. <laughs> Bad <laughs> yeah. grades in the works. It was horrible. I, I did good <clears> when I got back and went. You know. To back to college and stuff like that. It made all A's and stuff. Without a girlfriend or a wife, you do pretty good in school. That's a fair, fair statement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's yeah, awesome. But, so you got in, you said, so pre 9 11. Yeah, it's February 2000 is when I went in. I went in when I was 21. And where were you when 9 11 happened? I was in Motor Pool in Fort Bragg, North Carolina. So I'd already been through basic and AIT and 11 hotel school. So you go in as infantry or 11 x-ray. Um, so you can become 11 Bravo, 11 Charlie, um, 11 hotel. I was 11 hotel, which uh, is heavy weapons. The tow missile system. I think it was tube launched, optically fire, wire guided command linked missile system, whatever. So I did that. Um, so we practiced on the Mark 19 and 50 Cal, and then we went to airborne school and my first assignment, you, you have three uh, preference preferences where you want to go, which I picked like Hawaii and Italy and something else. And I go to Fort Bragg. So um, I was in the motor pool in Fort Bragg and we were getting ready to go on DRF-1, which is, I think it was called Deployment Readiness Front, which every certain cycle you go on to DRF-1 randomly, whether there's a war going on or not. And uh, one battalion was coming out and we were coming in. So the trade towers got hit and we were halfway in and they were halfway out. So they decided to push us in like we were going to go first. They ended up sending, sending uh, I think, 10th Mountain first or whatever to Afghanistan. But yeah, I was in the motor pool in Afghanistan or in uh 
uh, Fort Bragg. So, and I'm assuming that pushed you a lot harder in interest in where you're at at the time. Or it was, was funny it? though. I had a lot of animosity to the army because they didn't send us. You know, they didn't right, send right. the paratroopers in to jump into Afghanistan and do all that. I remember I had battalion staff duty, and it was. I want to say that night or the next night, something very like right after the trade towers, they had these maps laid out on a table about this size and all this stuff. And they knew that night or, you know, my recollection was that night or a couple, you know, a week later where it came from. We had drop zones all plotted for Afghanistan. And, uh, then they sent 10th mountain. Um, so we're all ready to go. We're on lockdown. We can't call anywhere. We can't do anything. If we go anywhere, we're, um, we have to be anywhere within, we have to be back into the company area within 30 minutes or something like that. Something stupid. But, uh, and then I get a persogram saying I'm going to South Korea. You call this number on a little piece of paper and it's like a, a robot voice. It says, you are to report to the Republic of South Korea, blah, blah, blah. What the hell? <laughs> I felt betrayed or whatever. So I went yeah. to South Korea right then. So I went to South Korea and I spent a year there um, in uh, 2nd Infantry Division, 1st to 503rd, Delta Company, Lemon Hotel, still yet. And uh, was there for a year. So uh, all the way up through my active duty time, which I got out and went back in because I wanted to go to the war. So I ended up joining a guard unit, um, moving to North Carolina, and I think it was first of the 120th Bravo Company. And uh, I think I was on the ground in Iraq within two weeks of moving to Charlotte. That's crazy. Yeah. So, yep. What was that like? Deploying or yeah. Charlotte? Both. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk Charlotte first. You started there, right? Well, I got married um it was stupid but i got i did get married um mainly i think for the pay kind of you get more of a pay yeah. and uh, going over married and um left went to iraq with nobody that i knew because it was a guard unit it was uh all guys that had been together some of them been together for 15 years no oh, wow and so I was out of my element. And it was yeah. a, the guard and the army. I remember when I first time I reported to that guard unit. And I didn't think of much of what I was wearing. I was in an army uniform like anybody else. But I had my EIB and airborne and air assault and all this stuff. And they hated me because of it. Kind of a, I don't know, it was a jealousy thing or, or what. But um, I remember a specialist came to me. He's like, hey, what's up, dude? And I'm a sergeant. And I'm like, what the, who the fuck are you talking to? Who the fuck? Is <laughs> and then some E7 pulled me away. He's like, hey, man, you can't, this ain't the Army. This is the National Guard. And I'm like, this, this is, says U.S. Army on my damn tags here. So it was hard for me in the Guard. It, I worked with a lot of good guys over there. But it was a different kind of thing right. in the 82nd and active duty. It was a, I ended up getting into a good squad and had a good, Good uh, leader, couple leaders above me, and then uh, everybody below me was uh, hardcore. They're ready to go. So, um, yeah, it was good. What were the other guys like in your squad? The one of them, my machine gunner, <coughs> Michael Gallagher. He was in the Gulf in the Marines. He was older than I was. I think I was about twenty five when that happened, and. Uh, he was squared away. This guy used to sit there, listen or reading a book, the the uh, Encyclopedia of Serial Killers. He would, he would <laughs> read that every night. And he had this. I don't know if he was acting out that genre of a person or what it was, but he was a good gunner, and he always chose to carry the two forty over the saw. I mean, patrol anything. He carried that heavy gun. Oh, yeah, but big guy. Not really. Not really? No. Nope. Like, yeah, that's cool. I had a squared away squad, everybody. <clears throat> Kyle Strickland, uh, Ash, they were all good. Yeah. Solid. Squad leader was good. 
Bravo team leader was good. <laughs> right on. Well, what was next for you after that? Well, we did a year there. I came home from uh, from Iraq, and I was done with the guard over there. And I went, I went home. I went back to Missouri, where we're at now. Um, and I had heard about a company called Blackwater through a guy that worked at the Pentagon. He was, I think, he was. Uh, he was either Secret Service for for Clinton, maybe, during that administration, or a part of it. He supported that, did something something in that capacity. And he told me about a company, and I applied and went into that. So went through the vetting, did all the deal for that. So 04 is when I went to the war, 05 when I got back, and then 06 I – went to Moyoc, North Carolina with Blackwater and went through all the vetting stuff for that. What was that like? Just It was pretty good. I mean, it was some of the most detailed vetting, I guess, or training. I never understood the difference between vetting and training because vetting is like, see, okay, this is, we want to see what you know, but it, what they trained us as well in close protection um, for State Department diplomats. So... The compound, I think it was 8,000 acres of everything you needed from shooting 203 grenade launchers, machine guns, sniper ranges, up to 1,200 known distance type of stuff, And uh, uh, which I didn't do any of that. But uh, um, they had a mock city set up with Are You Ready High School, like yeah, er- everything, that, yeah, yeah. Um, which Eric Prince was the owner of that then. And it gets complicated with that because it's it's not Blackwater anymore. No, it, it really isn't. It's not like they didn't change their name to disguise. It. It's not Blackwater anymore. Right. So people don't understand. It's a whole different deal now. That name just has an iconic ring to it. I guess. So, <laughs> it's either a, a love or hate. People who want to be around it, or and yeah. As your take being that, what do what do you feel? Just hearing the name. As far as what, like I don't know, just open ended. I don't know. I mean, it was uh, in the beginning. I got there in 06. You get there in 06, and you, you already felt like you've been through everything you can be through. You've already right. been through war, you know? So, and then you got all these guys all bouncing around like you're some new guy again. And, and I don't know if it was little guy syndrome with me. I was like, fuck you, motherfucker. <laughs> new guy, what? Like, I've already been here. What do you, I don't know. Um, It's hard to explain. It took a minute to realize there's there's shit bags everywhere, you know. Yeah. I don't know, but there was there was a lot of good. I worked with a lot of good guys in Blackwater. As far as the training. Uh... Oh yeah, the training. Okay. Cool. The training at Moyoc was it wasn't intense. It wasn't like the infantry. It wasn't physically demanding whatsoever. I've already been through the infantry, all that stuff. Um, what you had to do to qualify to be there was nothing. I mean, mile and a half run in a, I don't remember the time frames or what, but just stupid. Just kind of the standards stupid. similar to the, I assume the, they had an agility test. Now. It was stupid. <clears throat> um, mile and a half run. You shot the 249, the 240, shoot these little tombstones and, that was kind of tough. You had to sandbag in your guns because those guns aren't designed to hit the same spot. You know, you had to hit these little tombstones about like that three times each, and you had a certain amount of rounds, as I can remember. Um, but the medical stuff and the environment they stuck you in to make you feel what it was like over there was kind of cool. They had, from what I understand, they had like these makeup artists. They had to because they blindfold you and put in these cars. Right, put you in these cars. And you'd sit there and they'd just put you in there and they these guys would start bullshitting with you like you were just got to Baghdad or whatever. Hey, how's it going? Where you come what unit were you in? Blah blah blah. And you're playing the game, whatever, and then boom, like an arty sim goes off. Boom. And then it's contact, like contact left. And they pull the blindfold off and the you know, the T C the truck commander sitting there 
and his eyeballs hanging out and it looked real. His face is all burnt off and stuff. And there's like warm liquid coming out of red liquid coming out of him. And the driver's femoral is just pumping, pumping out. And there's somebody else. There's like an OC observing cadre looking at you like, what do you, what do you do? Yelling at you. And you got, you're putting fire down at guys shooting at you, uh, from the left. And, so you're shooting, shooting, shooting. Then you grab a tourniquet and you put it on the guy, obviously, that's bleeding out. And he's yelling, what do you do about the guy? What are you going to do with his eye? And I'm like, I'm not going to do fucking nothing about his eye. And that's all they wanted to hear. You know, like, okay, you're past. Go. So and then they have you go through a room. It was dark, no light. And someone's screaming. You got to find him and feel the blood going all over your hands, squirting out of him or whatever, and tourniquet him up. But All in the dark? Yeah. There's a 203 range, like I said, qualified with the M4, Glock 19. None of it was super hard, but uh, hard enough, you know, hard yeah. enough to weed out the stupid or whatever. What was the what was the part that drove you nuts in the training aspect? Where is the, where the suck fest kicked in? Um, the or clearance, getting like? the clearance. <laughs> yeah, with my the SF86, buddy, so to speak. Had your clearance expired then at that point? No, it was that my army clearance was a <laughs> DOD secret clearance, and then this the State Department was a different clearance, and I had credit issues. I had kind of bad credit, so my clearance got denied. I had to appeal it and repair my credit, and by this time, my buddies and good buddies were already getting gigs. Like, hey, you can go out. Your clearance is done. You can go to Afghanistan. So they went to Afghanistan, which there wasn't. I don't think there was a lot going on in Afghanistan then um, as far as what they were doing in Kabul. So it was kind of a blessing for me because I went to Baghdad once it finally went. I went to Baghdad, which was a lot more fun. There was a lot more stuff going on. Yeah. Missions were farther out. Enemy were coming at you more, which sounds weird. You would, wouldn't want that, but it was better. It was more stuff going on yeah I guess mm -hmm. right on so you started off in Iraq and uh, what was what was it like there I got there and I think I think it was late 06 like I said I got there and everybody nobody talked to you you're like nobody you know um, living was good it was a totally totally different than the military you know I've come from the military I remember getting off the plane there and realizing I step off, I think it was July, I think it was July of 06, I get off the plane and I'm like, whoa, and the heat hits me, and I, I'm thinking the jet wash is hitting me from the aircraft, I'm like, no way, it's this hot, you know, I couldn't remember that it had been, the, but it wasn't, the aircraft was not on, it was hot, um, and then I would just assume it would have been like the military, I'd get off and get out and it'd be just a bunch of bullshit and red tape and sitting for hours and everything but when, boom we're straight off over here down the stairs get your passport stamped and some dudes come up in these vehicles I never like Mad Max looking mom, South African mama looking stuff and hand you this vest and this gun you don't know if zeroed or whatever and looks all funky the weird forward grip and everything and hey Here's the route where we're taking this route back. If something happens at this point, we're coming back here. If something happens at this point, we're keeping going. And look right, you're sitting on the right side of the vehicle. Go. Straight to it. There's route Irish all the way back. So. Well, that's crazy. <laughs> not as you think. Not as much. Yeah, it was all right. But um, so, like I said, you get there and. Nobody wants to talk to you. They're just like, you're just, you're the new guy or there's a bunch of new guys at that point. There were, there's a lot of new people coming in there. Um, get your room and you're doubled up with somebody for your first rotation, which we were doing um, 90 days on, 30 days off. So this is the first time that I, I had worked directly with every aspect of any special operations forces or anything. So my roommate was a, a Green Beret. I won't say his name, but he's not around anymore. Um, uh, older guy, he was probably 60. 
60 years old, wow. just an OG, you know? Yeah. And uh, we were doubled up. The power would go out all the time, you know, it'd be hot as hell. But uh, real, really awesome. A lot of stories with that guy. Yeah, but a lot. This guy did a lot. You know, he used to tell me stories, and you know, when he'd get his ass beat in training and uh, special forces, he would be cutting wire. You know, be in training, cutting cutting barbed wire to sneak in somewhere, and they'd beat the shit out of him because he didn't wrap cloth around the wire before he cut it to make it quiet, you know, like crazy, crazy stuff. But I wish I could say his name. He was a, just a warrior, just a, he may have been over 60 years old, but later I learned, he, this is jumping ahead, but, uh, he, WPPS, World Wire Personal Protection yep. Services is what it was. And, uh, Every once in a while, there'd be some stupid little tiny thing where you didn't qualify anymore. You had to go back to more North Carolina and do like one extra little thing with the saw or something stupid. So you have to go through all of it again, like the mile and a half run. And he's like 60 something years old. He drank whiskey and smoked cigarettes all day. So he went back and he didn't make it. He didn't make it through, um, which doesn't mean nothing. Right. right. Dude, this guy was... He'd done everything. He'd been everywhere, done anything. He, like, wrote phases of books for the military. You know, he was, like, a mentor of mine. But uh, any for whatever source, he didn't make it. And then uh, I learned later on that he had died in a taxi cab, got shot in the head in Central America. Wow. I don't know if he went back in the military and was doing something or just down there fucking around and got hit. I don't, no. I don't know. But, <clears throat> Man. How was your relationship with him? Good, good. He drank a lot, but he I didn't drink right a lot a new in guy. Baghdad, man. We had a lot of indirect fire all the time, and a lot of guys were partying and doing stuff because it was what they call big boy rules or whatever. There, you could do whatever you want. You could drink, do whatever, whatever. <laughs> and uh, if you fucked up and you were found doing what you are doing, you are done. Yeah. But... Uh, he did his job well. Um, I don't know. So, how long, how long were you the new Pogue there? Like, how long did that last? Not long. After a while, you get you start getting. You know, I went. I don't, I don't know if it was because of my background with heavy weapons and stuff like that, but they put me. I think I drove for a little bit on the counter assault team. It was it was best to be on the counter assault team, in my opinion. That you had the close protection teams that rode in suburbans, armored suburbans, right? And you're just window lickers. You're in the truck all day long. Yeah. And if you're on the counter assault team, you're either in front of three suburbans that are armored or in the back in a Humvee. Then you're either the driver, the truck commander, right rear, left rear, or the turret gunner. And I was a turret gunner, which is a 240 Bravo up in the gun. Um, and I went right to pretty much to that. I think I drove for a minute, and then I was up in the turret. I'm pretty sure. I have a horrible memory. I'm kind of <laughs> odd. But uh, for all my time, pretty much, I was a turret gunner on CAT, counter yeah. assault team. And some people like to say there's shit going on all the time. 99.9999% I mean, of the time, you're just driving around and, and literally throwing water bottles at people people vehicles not just randomly some people were bad blackwater guys just like they were bad u.s soldiers that were mean to people too um but if a car you know you're coming through a traffic circle in at six out at nine or whatever and everybody's stopping you're blowing horns and sirens and telling people to stop with a key for whatever the whatever you're and there's one vehicle coming through you throw water bottles at their car. Right? <laughs> That's some random. Then later on, you had pin players that were 38 caliber little flashlight looking things where you pull the spring back and let it go. It's a firing pin. It's just a flare out. Uh, I never fired one of them. Um, but you had ammo cans around your, your turret shield. Your turret shields were probably AR 500 steel or something with uh, 
armor glass on it. And then he had, uh, you know, the metal straps that go around like crates and mm-hmm. stuff like that. So you had ammo cans strapped around that filled with water bottles and you had a shit ton more water bottles inside the vehicle. So when you ran out, guys left and right rear were hand, handing you more and you're throwing a lot of them in a day, you know. Um, sometimes you get madder than you should be and you're throwing them when you shouldn't. But right. most of the time, I, I'm not trying to be the saint or whatever, but I only threw them when I needed to. Um, so it'd be 16 vehicles that just fucking, boom, they stop. All right, cool. But there's one just weaving through, coming through, and you're like, what the fuck are you doing? And sometimes I wouldn't even throw it at them because I could look at them and they just had their head up their ass. It was just stupid ass. You can tell the demeanor in the car if you look hard enough. But if they're weird and they're acting funny or whatever, I'd throw a water bottle, break the windshield, knock the, you know, the mirror off the side of the car or whatever. And you got real good at that. And yeah, I was I'll good bet. at that because... I shot right-handed rifle. I was I, just I was getting a, ready to ask that. I was a left-handed hand? thrower. <laughs> <laughs> so you got your two forty out in front of you, just sitting there. Um, you're holding your rifle. I had an M4 with the two hundred three, and I could grab water bottles and just chuck them. You know. Yeah. And after a while, you got pretty good. I could put them in the sunroof. I mean, we could put them wherever you wanted them. You miss a lot too. And when you miss, that was a. a it was funny, but it wasn't. Those sometimes they wouldn't explode, and they would just slide for days across the road, you know, and hit somebody in the ankle or, you know, something. But uh, the water bottle—we could talk all day about the water bottles. <laughs> um, we got all day. You're talking about a, a <laughs> one-pound projectile, and you know, if you're going 60 miles an hour, 50 miles an hour in a Humvee. And someone's coming, you know, right at you. And you add them speeds and then add your throw to mm, it. Yeah. It's, it's like a hand grenade. Yeah. Uh, throwing them at them. And I don't know if it was just uh, how dumb some of these people were. I don't, I'm not saying because they're Iraqi or Muslim or whatever. Because they're throwing water bottles at Americans. <laughs> but sometimes they're just dumb. You know, you couldn't see their face. They were too far away, and you just had to throw it. And it sometimes it was borderline deadly, you know, the velocity of it by the time it got there or whatever, or where you're on a bridge and some car just kept coming, and you throw it, and they swerve. And there's a motorcycle doing the same thing on their on their left, and they get hit, and the motorcycles and the Tigris, you know? Yeah, that's crazy. So... A lot, a lot of stuff happened like that where you just, you didn't have any control over it, but I don't know. There could be a whole movie made about the water bottles. <laughs> I'm going to tell you. I'd be interested in checking that out. That's yeah, I'm sure there's a lot. What about a? Uh, you know, most people have music in their life. You in the music? Yeah. Musician? Anything? Play anything? I play guitar. Yeah, I played the guitar in Baghdad. Did you really? Yeah, we had a band in Baghdad. <laughs> I, I wanted to name the band. We never named the band. I wanted to name it the Young Republicans, but we never did name it. Um, th- there were four of us: Nick Dillon and um, Josh Hernandez, and Pete. Pete was lead guitar too, and we had a couple of backup guitar guys. I, I don't. There's no reason that I don't remember the name. I just have a terrible memory. I mean, it wasn't that they weren't around much or whatever. I'm just horrible. Um, So we played at different bars. We played at the CIA bar and the FBI bar. There's different bars they had there. Mm -hmm. We played at different embassies, Swedish embassy, American embassy and places. Um, We kind of paid gigs. No, no. no. (laughs) We kind of rat fucked the, the chapel. We didn't steal anything, but we played there. We played some pretty crazy stuff there, heavy, heavy metal stuff. And then we, um, I don't know what genre we stuck to. We played all kinds of different music. We weren't fucking, we weren't like awesome or nothing. Um, Josh was the singer and he's the one who kept, heard that I played guitar and wanted, hey, play with us. And I was on CAT, Counter Assault Team, and Josh was on, I think, Low Pro, where they traveled around in BMW 745Is, like Low Pro trying not to be seen. And 
I don't know if uh, Nick was on low pro or if he was on a high profile team with the Suburbans or what, but uh, and and Pete was on Blackwater Air. He was an aerial door gunner, and uh, so he would play lead when I wasn't on lead, and I would play lead when I was on when I was there, and uh, this is the way I remember it. Um, it was fun. It was really fun, but uh, now. So Josh is dead. Nick's dead. And uh, I saw Pete at Nick's uh, funeral not too long ago. But Josh died in Baghdad. I don't know. I don't know why. I don't know how he died, really. He had an aneurysm or something from shrapnel. I, I can't really get the story right. But no. That's a long story. No. And Nick was really close to Josh. So I went down to Texas recently for Nick's funeral. I'm not sure what happened there, if he was having too much fun or or what. Always hate hearing that, man. It seems like a... But they were both, you know, they were warriors, Nick and, and Josh. We would, I, I went with Josh one time later on when I was on Blackwater Air. Um, he was with us for some reason and we went to Ur or the lost city of Ur it's like where the first form of writing was cuneiform was it even that? writing in Iraq really and we flew out there and took some people out there to look at that so it's, the, it's the first civilization ever or something like that and there, there was stuff everywhere laying out there. There was, you could see it all around you, pottery and, and wow. things from, I think, somewhere around 6,000 years ago. We took some archaeologists out there and some FBI people or something. But I know more. I mean. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. That was one of the, that, this the last mission I did with, with him. But I didn't figure he... I didn't figure out he had died until two hours, two hours, two years after just doing our own things. I didn't know. Yeah. But. Well, with the music you said, heavy metal, is that you still my, bounce around my quite kind a of bit? Music? Yeah. Yeah. What do you listen to? Uh, what? I, what was I your fix? What was your music, muse? Uh, it's funny. I listen to like Blink-182 and Angels and Airwaves and I like. It's a little different for the disturbed. I like yeah. everything really, but country not too much. Yeah, is Angels and Airways and Blink is that stuff you listen to mm -hmm. while you're over? Mm, yeah, pretty much. It's kind of kind of funny, but yeah, no, it's not the typical, but no, it's good stuff. I definitely had my my phase of really enjoying both of those projects. It's funny those guys that sing that stuff probably wouldn't like me. You know, I don't know if they're liberal or what, but is it a you know the alien stuff? Is it Tom DeLonge that went on like crazy yeah, alien he was, stuff? I think. No, I'm not into that. No, I'm a Christian. <laughs> you think there's other life out there? No. A second world? No. No. I don't think so. I often wonder. You do? Yeah, I think I just that there's a point where I wanna, I wanna see that there's like maybe seven or eight other worlds out there. I, I like want to believe got. that stuff, but I'm a I'm a Christian, and I I think God made it all for us to show. Yeah. You know how big, how big he is. There's as far as we can see, as much as we learn, as far as we look, there's nothing else. It's just us. Fair enough. Just to prove, you know, I don't know. So if you see a UFO story, does that interest you at all to read it, or is it just? It does interest me. It does. Yeah. It's not like I'm. I'm not I'm still curious, you know. Right. Whatever. But have you have you looked into his stuff on it at all? I, a little bit, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's something uh Nat, which you know Nat. Yeah. Yeah, he uh he was real big into it. I still I mean I watched stuff the other night, I think, about stuff like that and just I, I watch a lot of stuff like I'm big into documentaries about um ancient history and you know, all them people how they, they, they look to the stars for all that crap. But yeah. I don't think there's any, there's nothing there. There's one God. That's it. It's all for us right here. That's it. Yeah. Well, I'm with you on that. Uh, hobbies, anything? While you're in versus now, anything changed, different? 
What did you do to pass the time? You guys like play the rock toss game? I hear that's popular with the locals. What is it? Well, I don't know. <laughs> Something about rock toss so you can throw a big rock the furthest? No. Maybe not in your areas? <laughs> no. Uh, Afghanistan, they had like, they played with a dead animal. <laughs> kind of like you do polo, they play with a dead animal. But for me, shoot, I mean, I play guitar some. I used to shoot a lot. I get just sick of that. But I don't know. I don't have many hobbies, really. Yeah. I hunt. Bow hunt. What animals? Deer. Turkey. You bow hunt turkey? Yeah. Is that pretty challenging? Yeah, it is. Not as much as... Yeah, I guess it's pretty challenging. I don't know. I was in a blind once with my dad growing up and watched him hit a turkey with one. And I just remember being pretty crazy and what seemed like it was, it was a pretty good distance, too. I don't remember maybe 22 yards, something like that. But it was, I don't know, it was just cool. Maybe five or six years ago, out the back of my house. And this is, I'll lead into this. It's, there's the hunting industry and there's hunting. If you really want to kill an animal or put food on the table or kill a turkey it's easy you know grab a 308 grab a but you can't it's, it's not legal or whatever but i was coming out of my house and i saw it was turkey season and uh, i saw some turkeys crossing left to right at the back of my house i got three acres there's it's kind of a rural area i think i was going to mcdonald's to get some food or something my bow's in my truck so i come out of my house i go through my garage so they don't see me go into my truck on on the driver's side and grab my bow and go around my barn and sit down and uh range a tree the farthest tree that i have in my it was 63 yards you know and here comes these toms male turkeys across the way and usually you don't have time when a turkey sees you you need to be in a blind or something and I nothing i can do so i'm just like i just pull back and when i pull back i see i have a field point Instead of a broadhead on my the arrow that I grabbed, <laughs> like a shit, and I pull back, aim at him, put my sixty pin on him, just just barely come up a little high, and spit it off, boom. It's the only turkey I ever hit that dropped, didn't flap a wing with a field point. Yeah, what distance? Around sixty. Sixty three. That's 60, crazy. Something like that, and then the next day I shot one at fifty five. <laughs> yeah, I was burnt out on turkey hunt. <laughs> that ended it. Mm-hmm. I had Done. years of trying, and uh, it's like it's one thing or another went wrong. I remember one year having a tom heading right at me, and I had a Browning A5 shotgun. It was my grandpa's. Tried to run the trigger, it didn't work. Check the safety again. I had turned it off. Tried to pull the trigger the again, what? it didn't work. Uh, Browning A5. So it's an know. old auto. Uh, Really weird action. You take the barrel and press it against the ground as you're running the action. The whole shotgun like pumps into it. See, I don't know much about a lot of guns like you do. <clears throat> it's an old, it's an old classic one. It's interesting. This it is my grandma's wedding present to my grandpa. About 72, 73 years. I'll show it to you after this. I yep. got it here. But uh, it's Belgian made, so it's just kind of cool. Just yeah. and obviously the story behind. It. He actually had it stolen too and recovered. Everyone so. always assumes I know a bunch of about a bunch of guns. I don't. <laughs> What, what's what's your jam when it comes to guns? What do you like? Like like military or anything? Whatever, yeah. What's Mark nineteen? Mark nineteen? <laughs> yeah, we we're at eleven hotels. We were you're either a Mark nineteen gunner and a tow gunner, a tow missile gunner, mm-hmm. or a fifty gunner and a tow gunner. I was in the eighty second. I was a Mark, pretty much a Mark nineteen gunner and a fifty gunner. I got top gun in Camp Lejeune. We drove to Camp Lejeune and shot a shot the Mark 1950. Yeah, I think it was against the Marine equivalent to an 11 hotel, whatever that is. And uh, I like Mark 19. It's almost a precision weapon if, <laughs> if you can shoot it right. Using the T and E and learning how to work it from a turret and from the Humvee. I mean, I like it. The bigger the gun, I, I like. Seeing something recently regarding uh, mounts for those where kind of like a, have you seen the camera mounts where they can run and they don't shake and it's just like hanging out? On a gimbal type of thing? Yeah. Yeah, basically like gimbal style mounts for the 50s. Oh, that'd be awesome. Uh, yeah. I'm too <laughs> like rolling, trekking through the desert, all the crazy bumps and everything, and that thing's just hover mode. 
I remember, you know, shooting the 50 or mark on the traversing an elevation unit. And, you know, you pull it down and to the left because there's play in it. Yeah. You know, when you lock it down, there's a little bit of play in it. You pull it down to the left. And the, hard, the harder you do it, the better better you get at it. And, you know, you do your elevation and left and right. And then once you have it on it, you can just let it go. I remember down in Camp Lejeune on the Mark 19, I'd have it. The first target, you're sitting there for hours waiting, just typically in the Army. And some general comes out and blows an arty sim, and, okay, you're ready to go. Um, then you didn't have to aim. You already dialed in. You've already done your all your right. shit. And then you could literally just push it down the left and look behind you and just <laughs> and put them through windows at, like, nine 900 yards. That's crazy. But I like the Mark 19, but you can't have the Mark 19 without the 50. It doesn't go through anything. I shot through HESCOs in Iraq. I remember trying to see what it could get through. Shooting HEDP through HESCOs, and you can't get you know, HESCO HESCO barrier. It's just a like hog wire with pretty much paper in it, filled with dirt. And you'll never get through it. Hmm. You know. You have any issues running that gun? The Mark Nineteen. Yeah. I have issues with other people running that gun. <laughs> I, mean, I went on leave with in the army, and I guess they got in contact, and someone was on a Mark Nineteen and said it was broke. It's done. When I got back, like, hey, you know how to fix this? And I was like, I knew it wasn't broke. I'm like, it ain't broke. They didn't realize you charge it once, and you have to pull the trigger, and it's just shoom, and then nothing happens. You got to charge it again. Right. And go. That was it. I'm not positive if I remember this correct. Uh, I worked on the HK's GMG, which is their equivalent of the Mark 19, and I'm pretty sure they have the option where you can run the trigger again. I don't know what that is. I'm not sure. It's it's yeah, it's HK's Heckler and Coke. It's their version of the Mark 19, basically. So Heckler and Coke, is that how you yeah. say it? Heckler and Coke, not you the said other Heckler way. And Koch, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, Heckler and Coke. I actually trained with a Heckler and Coke, I guess. Um, before I went to Blackwater, I didn't have a Glock and trained with a what was it? With some of the model pistols. USP, P2000. Yeah, USP. Yeah. Yeah, I don't like them. That guy right there. Yeah, there it is. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't threaded like that, but. Yeah, it's the, I think that's a 45 tactical. So I think the little... best pistol ever is that ugly one right there. Uh, the G-Lock. Mm-hmm. The Glock, 19 or 17? 19. Well, I mean, 17 is probably more. I'm just used to that. The 19. Grabbing that 19, yeah. Yeah. Sure, the 17 is better because longer barrel and everything but ah, man those I'm sure sales is down like crazy it seems like any, every, everybody's just talking about 19 anymore oh really yeah and of course they got the new the new slim ones and everything like the 43X and the 48 it's like a slim down version you seen the folded shit yeah yeah I saw that on uh, what Demolition Ranch yeah yeah he does all that that guy's awesome <laughs> but yeah yeah well, we carried the Glock 19 the M4 Colt Full auto. I never switched to full auto in combat ever. How'd that rifle run for you? Great. I mean, I never had. We, ne- we were never in like sustained. I was never in like sustained, like where you could put a gun to the limits. You know, that's what I was here. Everybody was like, I like the AK better than the M4. I'm like, I don't know why the fuck you do. I guess if, I guess if you're running like burning barrels up or shooting for long, 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 long periods of time, maybe the the AK is better, but. I like the M4. Yeah. Yeah, I turned into an AK guy for quite a while and dabbled into it and was convinced it was going to become a new primary. And then I picked up an AR again and wised up. I, just, I like this a lot better. I respect the heck out of the AK. but uh, I haven't shot it a lot. I started shooting some of it. When I went from Blackwater, I was in, went from um, Iraq. I was in Baghdad with the counter assault team. I was coming back from a mission one day, and my truck commander said, like, hey, we're going to go do the the air quals to get on air. I'm like, I don't, I don't want to go to air. They look like all, they were all, they never talked to us. They were weird. They flew around the blue Little Birds and the blue four, Bell 412s and stuff. I, I didn't care about it. I wanted to be on the ground. Um, I don't like helicopters. Um They're supposed to crash all the time. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, I, wasn't, I wasn't really scared of it, but I just, uh, whatever. I want to be on the ground. I'm used to it. Um, so I'm like, fuck it. All right. We went and I get there and the head guy, I won't say his name, but 
he's reading off all these names of people that are supposed to be there and he gets to me he's like who the fuck are you I'm like, Tommy Breedlove <laughs> he's like what the fuck are you doing here and I was like I don't know and I fucking just said alright I'm gone I'm leaving I'll walk back it wasn't very far and uh, I'm like, oh fuck it you're gonna do the qual alright so we did the quals. It was a little tougher than like the regular State Department qual or whatever for Blackwater. And I'm not the best shot all the time. You know, I'm not the best shot. But that day I shot really fucking good. I shot good. I shot like perfect. <laughs> you know, I did all my shit where you're shooting. Uh, you sit on a fucking picnic table and you're shooting. And then when your mag runs out, you don't drop it. You got to... They got to see that you're going to put it behind your back and not let it fly out right. of the aircraft. And you're shooting these little circles. I wasn't even hitting the fucking circle. I was just aiming right at it. So I was hitting below it because I had an ACOG on. So I was hitting down here. But they were all touching. And you do these um, like OSB board sitting up. And you got one round in each mag. And you're like, boom. And then you reload behind cover. And boom, out the other side. Um, but I shot really good. So I went on leave. This is a big story. I went on leave, um, or long story. And a buddy of mine called me. I was back home, acting like an idiot, spending money like a idiot. I remember I was driving. I was it was uh, January. It was cold as fuck. And I he called me, and I saw it was my buddy in Baghdad. So I pulled into Bass Pro parking lot in Springfield, and. Uh, He's freaking crying and stuff. I'm like, and this is like big old fucking dude, you know, like not like that at all. My truck commander for cat and we were on fast cat at the time. I, we went from cat and then we made a special unit called fast cat where we got to travel the city alone. And you had tactical support team TST that would, they were the ones that were the most alone at the time. They would hang out in neighborhoods strategically located in between a few teams that were spread out Ministry of Interior Ministry of Oil Ministry of Finance or whatever so they had a lot of freedom but they were in these big South African Mambas and the Blackwater Grizzly vehicle and things like that and uh, we, we made this fast cat so where it was two Humvees and an ERV uh, like an EVAC with a medical platform in it uh, excuse me so, a lead and a trail Humvee and, and a up armored suburban in the middle with a really good medic and some shooters as well. Um, so five in each Humvee. So we got to run the streets. We'd be anywhere we wanted. You know, we just kind of we wouldn't even stay stationary. We just kind of bounce around wherever we wanted, just having fun throughout the red zone, not doing stupid shit. Just you know, staying within distance where we can get to any team if something happens. And uh, he called me. After I went on leave, after I did the air call, went on leave, and he said, hey, and he's just bawling. I'm like, what the fuck is wrong with this guy? And that's January 23rd. We um, we lost a little bird, and I hate that I miss it. It sucks. You know, because my gun in position, somebody else is gunning in my truck, and they go out, and they're fighting their way through the city to find a down um, little bird we had down. Nobody could find it because it didn't smoke and it went down between big buildings on a little building and it just no one could find it from what he says. There's actually some footage on YouTube. I have to tell you how to find it. But it's, Send that to me. We'll see if we can throw that in us. Yeah. And I can see my buddies on my truck, 2-4 Golf there, and it's being filmed from a striker military so we're fighting alongside they're fighting along mili uh, US Army infantry guys and uh, you can see their grenades coming down from the building and blowing up too soon on the way down from a apartment building or whatever and my truck commander walking around crazy and <laughs> one of my good buddies keep dragging him over and getting him behind cover again And but he called me after all that so we lost a little bird, and then we lost a, a good guy, a gunner on a little bird. He got shot while gunning from the side, and he dangled from his lanyard, and they pulled him in. But So we lost five guys that day. But what's good, though, is the gunner that was in my spot coming down the road, good driver, which I had a engagement when he 
that driver ended up being my truck commander later on. Um, he was driving. He was smart. He was driving down the road, heading to try to find this aircraft into fire, whatever. And uh, someone tossed two hand grenades into the road, and they're rolling across the road, like, you know, left to right, right? Or right to left. Say left to right. And instead of, like, seeing that, and your first reaction is to swerve away from the grenades, he saw the velocity of the grenades rolling across the ground. He swerved this way. So it only blew out the tires on the other side and blew out, you know. So they rolled under the vehicle and blew out the side. And I don't know how long they stayed in the fight there, but they had to go back to the checkpoint, so-and-so. And there was another cat team vehicle there waiting to go. Like, all right, where where we need to go? Where we go? And they're like, "Fuck you, get out of your truck, I'm taking your truck." They took their truck, <laughs> cross loaded whatever they needed out, and went back out in the fight. And I don't know if the gunner uh, got these guys then or before the grenade hit the hit the tires, but uh, he saw the gunner or driver or somebody saw the one of the passengers of the aircraft being drugged across the street, nearly naked by the insurgents there and uh, got him, you know, or mowed into him. And he was shooting at guys that are... I, I've heard stories from TST. TST was out there too, tactical support team with Blackwater as well. Um, another real good guy, big motherfucker, big dude. He, he His mount got shot. They had two, two turrets on these big... Uh, money truck looking armored vehicles and um, the, I guess the mount got shot or got broke or somehow or another. I think it got shot so he couldn't fire the 240 on the mount this dude was so big Jack I mean, I'm talking about 200 round belt hanging off or still laying in the drum or whatever or in the ammo can and he's just shoulder firing this like an M4 I mean just a jack dude and uh hitting guys in the knees and, you know, poking up the hiding buildings and stuff like that. But my replacement gunner, which he wasn't, he ended up, he was a truck commander, real good dude, real big squared away Marine. Um, he ended up getting those guys that drug him across the street and they recovered all, everybody. But uh, missed all that just because I was on leave, a normal, normal plan leave. Yeah. And I had a shooting before that leave, um, I don't remember what month it was. Was it with that tr same truck commander? Then, um, like I said, my memory is fucking horrible. I can tell you about that if you want to hear about it. Sure. But I'll be backtracking, <laughs> I guess. So, who were we talking about? Okay. Um, January 23rd is a a date any Blackwater guy is going to know exactly what we're talking about but um, most civilians or anybody else wouldn't wouldn't know um, well, you backtracking oh 07 backtracking a little bit so before I went on I went on leave and I missed the January 23rd attack on the Blackwater Little Birds um, we lost four Amazing guys. Two of the pilots. There's two pilots that work for Blackwater. I won't say their names, but they were brothers. One of them died that day. And everybody on that aircraft and a gunner from another. The sister bird that was helping them out. Um, a lot of amazing soldiers. I don't know what unit they were in in the Army, but I guarantee you they were infantry in strikers among other things there, there's some youtube fitted footage of uh guys shooting barrets from inside buildings and just blowing up dust and they they fought right alongside it was a long battle probably three and a, three and a half four hours or more um if you can find that footage it'd be good to tie into this but uh Going back before I went on leave to, and I hate this, it's not about me, but it's my story, I guess. Yeah. Uh, 
before January two, before I went on leave, and that I I was involved in an incident. Good friend of mine was driving. Best driver. Best ranger I've ever known. Best guys I've ever worked with were rangers. Even though I've gotten fights with some of them about me being 82nd Airborne and <laughs> where they sent their week was the 82nd. And we, we about fought one day, a good friend of mine, Josh, on air. Um, he said, he said, you know where we send our guys that don't make it in the rangers? And I was like, where is it? Back to the 82nd. I said, you know what we did with him, right? He's like, what? We made them fucking soldiers. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he called me out to the desert, and I stood up and let's go. <laughs> and we worked it out before fighting. But um, my buddy Jared was driving. Chuck was the truck commander. I was gunning like usual. Running through Baghdad. We had little points on the map. An intersection would be called Gray so and so, or uh, a venue would be called this color, another number, whatever. And we get to Gray so and so, and man, I had a funny feeling. Everybody says I get this feeling and shit, and I'm always like, what the fuck ever? Nobody gets no damn feeling or nothing. But I did. This fucking truck car was a. Uh, he had a sunroof, too, because I was up in the turret, and I could see down. We're in traffic. Now, Baghdad's, uh, it's not like we're keeping every vehicle far away from us and shooting everybody and, keep. you know, we're all, we, we've got to be in the mix of vehicles. We can't just be hitting every vehicle, even though we had a lot more lenience in what we were doing than, than the common army guy or whatever. Um, this vehicle just kept, what felt like to me was, harassing us and so we're in a Humvee we're running I think we were running light cat that day light cat there's light cat and heavy cat heavy cat it's a Humvee in front and a Humvee in the rear of three vehicles in the middle holding somebody and, and a bunch of shooters and people I want to say we were running heavy cat so I, I was in the rear, um, which normally you have your, your main gun, your, your 240 f facing to the six. And back then, it ain't automated turrets where you hit a button and the turret moves. You're using your ass to move it around. And you learn how to do that, especially when you're a little guy. I had rips all in my 5'11 pants from moving it with my butt <laughs> as little as I am and using the turn of the traffic circle to unhook it and get it to turn when I needed it to. But this this vehicle's fucking with us. And finally, Jared had seemed like had enough. And I'm throwing water bottles. I'm taking water bottles out of the ammo cans, holding my M4 with the 203 up here and tossing water bottles, you know. I'm not just shooting people that I think it, it's not like that. It's not what people think Blackwater is. I'm going to shoot somebody that I think they're something. A lot of guys have their head up their ass. They just do. And... American or not, but I'm throwing water bottles down. I'm going right through the sunroof, hitting him in the legs, hitting him in the shoulders, and he's still just staying right with us and pushing us over. We're coming right into a traffic circle. So this this circle here is the traffic circle. We're coming in, we're coming into the traffic circle in at six, six o'clock, six o'clock, three o'clock, twelve o'clock, nine o'clock, in at six, out at twelve. Yeah. And just before we get in the traffic circle, Jared had had enough and he turns into the vehicle and I can see the vehicle just crushing. I mean, glass breaking, Humvee, what seems like is going over the hood of the car. The guy's like this, not even hands on the server because I'm hitting so many times with water bottles. And he holds us up just enough to where the motorcade that we're protecting is farther away from that, that we'd like. And uh, that's about the time I start saying you know you're talking about like i said 99.999 of the missions you're just running through the motions you could probably close your eyes and look like you're looking around and nothing's going to happen as long as you stay alert and if enemy's looking you're nothing's going to happen but that day i didn't think that 
As you hold this up just enough, we're in at six, go around the traffic circle, start to come in. And I start to look to the nine and look to the six and it wasn't a very high building. It was a funny story because it was probably 15 to 25 meters, I'd say. So I, I'd say it was three stories where he was at. I, I know he was on the top floor. And it was kind of a building where there's no windows. It's just a dark hole, a big, tall, dark window where if you're standing in the window, your head's nowhere near the top of the window. Right. And there's a fucking Apache hovering over this building. Loud enough to where it's loud. I mean, I got Peltors on. It's just... And I, I can see the pilots. I guess they're both pilots in the Apache. I don't fucking know. But I can see them. I can see them with their glasses. I can see them. And they're they're in the, the helicopter. And I turn. Not the turret. But I turn. I'm holding my M4. And I turn around to the 6 coming through an intersection. I'm looking at that building. And... Uh, I start seeing muzzle flash out the building. Just, I, I can't. I don't think I heard anything, but I just, I just see a flash really high in the window, abnormally high in the window, and I'm not gonna lie. I, I'm pretty sure I almost dropped my rifle outside the turret shield. Wow! And just barely got it back. I wasn't getting hit. That the truck wasn't getting hit. But the con I know the concrete behind me was getting hit because I was getting hit in the neck underneath my helmet and stuff with pieces of something, not bullets, but but something enough to know, know something was going on. And I finally get my rifle and turn around, and I remember firing two shots. I remember because my ACOG was broken. It was always broken. The, there's a little plastic tube on top with a yellow... You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, where, fiber optic. Yeah. Inside of it that draws light in, and it never did draw light. And it was broken at some point in that yellow where it was just a black triangle. And we had the cheap ones, the uh, two power. Is it two power? Four. You What's sure? the negative? They may make it. I don't know. I just know the four powers is their main one. Anyway, there was nothing in it, in those ACOGs, but the triangle. There wasn't a line underneath it or a vertical line or anything. It was just the triangle. I love ACOGs, but it was a cheaper one. And uh, it was black. So when you're aiming that in the black window, sometimes it'll turn a little gray or reddish. But I remember firing, boom, boom, scared. And I remember seeing the side, the left side of the window on the concrete just, I missed twice. And I always carried 28 rounds in my mag. As you should. No, not out of not. I just was told that. I yep. never knew any truth to it, but I, I did that. Um, and I'll get to why I'm saying that. But I shot those two rounds and missed. And I remember it was kind of like slow motion. It was just like, tw tw I could see these. And they were, I just remember thinking in my head, why is that so high in the window? It was at the very top of this window. It was like an eight foot fucking window. Like a big, huge, I don't know how to explain it. Be like seeing the muzzle flash on the rooftop. Right. And I just was shooting right into the flash, putting the tip of my top of my triangle into that. And I shot, I wouldn't know this, but I then, but I shot seven more rounds. And we were running a gauntlet. We were in at six, out at nine, running straight out. And the building's here. So I, I wasn't completely smart in that whole deal because I stopped firing after nine complete rounds once I counted you know, 28 minus, you know, whatever I shot. And uh, never transitioned to 40, to the 240. And Chuck never let me live it down. I talked to him fairly recently. And I've never, why didn't you go to the 240? Whatever. But the fire stopped. And, uh, of course, we, you know, I'm, I'm yelling out. They didn't even know I was shooting in the vehicle. Wow. I don't, I don't know how, but I'm yelling out, contact, 6 o'clock, and firing. And we get we go down this, what seems forever, and Jared is the best driver. And what I mean by this is not like some kind of NASCAR fucking crazy driver. I mean a driver that's getting shot at and knows he's getting shot at at some point in there and knows I'm firing back. 
you're standing in a vehicle shooting from a moving platform and instead of him trying to subconsciously not get shot by like doing some crazy shit or going yeah. into cross traffic or whatever <laughs> or to cutting down a road and not following the motorcade he just he slowly lets off the gas and he just, just float mode floats straight to make sure that I'm getting a, a good shooting platform and the shooting stops I remember just just still looking up and aiming at him and, and not firing anymore for some reason I don't know why I did that but then we finally made a left and at the same time Chuck's probably calling in to so and so base saying contact who we are where we're at linking back up and you know the motorcade and lead cat if they were there I can't remember you know what's happened they can hear it all so we stop reconsolidate reorganize I'm literally just coming to and nobody's a fucking bad I'm like checking my helmet I don't know if I'm hitting the lungs even you know I'm just right. like okay adrenaline in my head I've got some scratches on my face from the concrete he was shooting behind me and hitting the Humvee hitting the concrete behind me and spitting up asphalt or whatever it was and uh I think it was before we even got back to base. And this is heading out. I don't know the cardinal direction, but where we would be heading out to route Pluto. And then heading right at some point and circling back over the tigers back into the where we live. And uh, it was a blessing because we heard that the Marines, some Marine unit was pushing through there looking for a sniper some intel looking for a sniper and uh, I guess they cleared that building and found that guy from what I hear from from my higher up um, they found him I mean, he wasn't living but so was that your first engagement with Blackwater yeah What went on through your head afterwards? Anything? You... No, I, mean, I don't know. Um, it, it just it, it felt like too perfect. Like, what, what do you mean you found him? What, what, like, a, like it's because you still have that thing, like the army thing. Like, did I do the right thing? Anybody else get hit? Am I getting to get in trouble? What right, the fuck right. is going on here? Um, but. Um, I don't have many details of what, like, what he was shooting at me or why the fuck was he missing? You know what I mean? That That's another thing over there, man. That's so many times with whether it was indirect or indirect fire or, you know, direct fire or something. These guys fucked up so many times. It's like, I know a lot of U.S. soldiers died. A lot of people I know died. Not a lot, but people I know died and, you know, they fucked up a lot. I don't know if that's God, if that's how fucking stupid they were or, or what. But we were, even the military, we were all reactive. I mean, even after 04, we were fucking completely reactive, which was just unsatisfactory. They just, they miss a lot. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Um, whether it was EFPs or indirect fire, we had indirect fire on the camp. I can tell you some stuff about that um but that that was my first engagement and and then I went on leave like I said I, I'm backtracking but I I went on leave and I'm not sure how long after that that was but then I heard got the call and pulled in the Bass Pro parking lot my buddy uh, pretty much a, a Spartan warrior called me crying so I'm like what the fuck is going on here and it would, you know, he, I guess he knew a lot more guys than I did. Um, but he knew a lot of them guys. Yeah, I think he was on air before me, so he really knew them guys. And I miss that fight, man. I, I hate that I miss that. Selfishly, I hate that. Because it's not for the reason of the guys. Like, because you know, it already happened and I couldn't have saved him and I couldn't have killed more than the dude gunning for me. He was fucking shit hot squared away, too. Or, he was shit hot squared away. And 
I just wanted to be there. Like, yeah. Like I would think anybody would want to be. It's like you missed a football game. But that January 23rd deal was a, it was a, I don't know, it was a big deal for Blackwater. It was a bad, sad deal. There was a helicopter and four guys and lose a gunner on another one. Um, but there was a lot of enemy dead on that deal. That's what we won. So people don't like to hear it. You hear it, you know, U.S. soldiers dead, or this guy's dead, or this guy's dead. With Americans, there's always a lot more enemy dead. Politics aside, we, we win. I don't know. But I came back and then pretty much immediately went to Blackwater Air which is a little bit more of a elite deal or whatever, I guess, because there was less guys. Is that what that means? I, but it would have been cooler if I stayed in Baghdad and maybe got on a little bird or something like that, but they were taking volunteers to go to Nazaria, and I'm the newest guy. I'm like, hey, I'll go. So I left a lot of friends when I did that, and Cat was my passion then. I was a truck commander at that point. I wasn't a gunner. And I went down south with six gunners and nine pilots, which was fucking bullshit because the six gun you got three birds, six gunners. That means no days off. But you got two pilots that got days off. <laughs> <laughs> but and that was just nonstop missions, Basra back to Baghdad. And by missions I mean <clears throat> Some of these missions were absolute bullshit. We were supporting another company, which wasn't bullshit. Uh, we, we flew some high-level general generals around. Um, like I said before, to flew some people to Ur, the city, the, mm -hmm. the oldest civilization. I don't know what for. Um, we flew back, back to Bad, Baghdad a lot for supply runs of different things. Which we didn't know until we got there, and we were running missions like that, you know. 08 was a bad, it may be, like I said, there's a God. We, uh, I go to Nazaria, and Baghdad starts getting hit. And we went from like six to nine rockets or mortars a day into the green zone in Baghdad. And sometime in 08, it was like 100 rockets, 160. I mean, a tough, hardcore dude is just fucking big eyes and helmets on and shit coming up to the aircraft. I'm like, what are you doing, dude? Why are you getting your helmet on? Dude, let's go to the embassy now. Sleeping at the embassy, you know, a hard structure. Um, crazy. That was a, I think it was a, I may be wrong, but it, it, I think it was Al Sadr, Sadr City and Al Sadr was like a big push for them. They were, pushing a lot of indirect fire and then but people always talk about Blackwater Air oh, whoa, that was crazy and they, they called they like some soldier wrote some kind of a little book or some story about the rock stars of Baghdad these Blackwater guys cruising around flipping people off and all that and it wasn't I love cat. I love being on the ground. We drew, we flew around a lot, and it was cool being in the hell, hanging outside of the helicopter and all that kind of stuff. But it was mostly boredom. I was half asleep half the time. <laughs> There's a lot of swamps in Iraq, too, man. We saw the big. I'm a hunter, and we saw the biggest hog you've ever seen. You can see their cutters from the aircraft flying over. It's hogs just jumping up and running through these swamps with water kicking up. I wanted to get one of them so bad with the saw and send it into like field and stream or something. <laughs> one guy did. Really? Yeah, I think he, I heard that he did and he brought it back to the chow hall to be cooked and they made him dump it somewhere. Yeah, I was going to ask. So that's <laughs> well, I'll tell you, a hog is good anywhere you kill it. Doesn't matter what it's eating, what it's doing. Yeah. 
Yeah, I remember that was some of the all of the wild hog eradications and everything they're trying to do all over the place, and people talk about it, cooking them up and enjoying them, especially the uh, the younger ones. Oh yeah, the little ones I think are better. I killed a couple big ones in Oklahoma, and, or one big one in Oklahoma, and I killed a bunch of little ones. The little ones are good eating, and the big ones are supposed to be like ground up for like breakfast sausage and stuff like that. But, yeah, yeah. Ever done a traditional over the fire? Pig roast. Um, I did a. I cooked a goat in Afghanistan on goat. ATA. I worked for a different company after Blackwater for a year. My last year contracting at all in Afghanistan. We haven't even got to Afghanistan, but um, I cooked a goat like Greek style, <laughs> like spit roasted. Yeah, it was good. Goat's good. People aren't used to hearing that, but. Nope. That's good. Not on here. That's crazy. Talk to an Indian or Arab fella. They're good. Do you have anybody you took a liking to? Like uh, uh, maybe more like an influential person or anything like that while you're in the Blackwater? Like my friends there? What do you mean? Yeah. I don't know. Anybody that seemed to like, the, I don't know, a mentor or someone that – maybe took you under their your wing or someone who just respected more than the average guy or anything? Yeah. My, my truck commander in Baghdad and a lot of guys that weren't above me that worked alongside me. That was a weird thing about Blackwater. You be on a counter assault team vehicle and your driver would be a CAG guy and truck commander would be a ranger and your left rear would be a marine recon guy and your right rear would be a navy seal and you'd be up gunning watching them all and a lot of these guys were older i mean they had 20 years in you had six you know 50 years of experience on the truck wow but you realize other things when you get into that stuff too is you think every Navy SEAL or every Green Beret or every recon guy or every ranger is just a shit hot bad motherfucker it's not I mean there's some shit bags everywhere I met a lot of good guys though don't I'm not, don't focus on the shit bag stuff I'm saying but I don't know you get kind of narrowed into what you used to do and as a grunt as in the infantry you know you're stuck in it all the time you, I'd gravitated to ranger guys and infantry guys and marine infantry guys you know I don't know if it was because you were always stuck in it and sitting in a frozen foxhole or for long periods of time didn't mind that high priority mission stuff or I took you know this high priority target of the ace of spades or whoever in Baghdad I don't care I, I I like the guys that we're used to being out for 12 months at a time you know and All right. staying out with shitty equipment and the bitching's okay if the bitching stops or something wrong <laughs> there's a, truth, a lot of truth to that I think yeah but I learned a lot from <clears throat> a lot of guys it took a lot of like of course in the age thing I didn't work in like small unit tactics like all these you know special operations guys and stuff but you know kind of a I don't know how to explain it it's like a I don't know I don't know how to explain that I met a lot of good guys and a lot of bad guys just like I did in the army you know People think Blackwater's all like a bunch of where you got the left saying everybody's just a fucking killer, war profiteer, bunch of bullshit. They're all these guys are decorated. I mean, there's a lot of they're all veterans back in the day. They were all they all been to war, you know, all Marines and infantry and special operations and you know there's there's bad people in the military too throw bottle you know throw water bottles when they don't need to or shoot pin flares at people they don't need to or you know what I mean yeah I don't know we'll see in our realm too obviously <laughs> on the uh, yeah. state side 
but <clears throat> they they tend to find their way to fix <clears throat> out. You know, where once people got an opinion of something, the organization is done. Yeah. So, oh, what was that like? The, uh, I mean, obviously things came highly televised at one point, and the Blackwater name had a bit of a bad reputation. <clears throat> yeah, I was there during all that. You talking about Nisor Square? And yeah. Was it September? It was either September fourteenth or September twelfth. I can't remember, but. Whichever one it was, I had a shooting, another shooting I was involved in two days before that incident um, on Route Irish. But um, I used to play video games with one of the guys that were was involved in that New Source Square deal. And I don't know them guys very well. And I don't know, I wasn't there. I don't know exactly what happened. I can speculate things that happened I know how it started I know there was fighting I have brothers that were you know at ministry of whatever when the V-bid went off the, the vehicle borne improvised explosive device went off and the team in question was heading there to go help them um, I know that they ran into contact before they got there from the vehicles that they were in. I know that for sure. Um, and I know there were enemy killed right there where they were at. Uh, as far as innocent people they were killed, I don't know. Wars aren't fought on some distant battlefield where it's just them and us, right. you know? And sometimes when you're in a firefight and you're shooting an enemy and the enemy are shooting at you and there's lulls in the fight when nothing's happened and somebody walks out on a cell phone or you've got this stuff built up in you and he's some guy's poking out on the phone and looking at you. I don't if it's a kid or a woman or, or whatever, you're like, the fuck are you doing here? Why are you still here? It's just, I mean, there's four people dead here and there's bullets everywhere and one of our trucks is blown up. The 240 barrel's bent straight up on one vehicle from whatever and a car's blown up, not from 240 fires. That doesn't happen. The whole thing's in pieces. It was a V-bid. Somebody might get shot. Keep poking their head out. I don't, I don't know. I, re I really don't know everything. Because I've talked to some people I really love and trust and worked with that are like, yeah, they did too much. And I've talked to people that said they did what they did and they should have done what they did. And just whatever I mean you got six people shooting at you and there's a kid standing in front of six people shooting at you what are you going to do I don't know I don't think they should be in prison but where are the bodies at what, what, what happened you know the FBI came out we protected the FBI when they came back out two weeks later in a war zone to tape off an area you don't think that Something may have been tampered with. I, I have no idea. Vehicles were shot the hell up. There was a 240 machine gun barrel bent straight up from a vehicle, you know, getting fucked up. Yeah. I don't know. I just don't think there's enough evidence for former Marines and 82nd guys and whatever else they were to be sitting in prison. Yeah. Well, there's recent news. What is it? Is it pardon? Have you seen that? Like maybe Trump's looking at a pardon for one of them or something? I don't know if he's looking at it. I've heard it's headed to his desk or, or, or something. Um, so maybe opening up a case or something in recent news. So. I don't know. <clears throat> in my opinion, it, I don't. I don't know them guys very well. A lot of it doesn't make sense to me because some of the key leaders, key leaders that led that team, they're not in prison. I mean, what? Interesting. I don't know. Were, were the key leaders not able to say cease fire? I mean, I, I don't, I have no idea. And it is a touchy situation. I mean, these are private people blessed off by the United States government and State Department. And any rules of engagement were just gray you know, did that did that follow up with a ton of new rules and everything on rules of engagement? 
Um, I think uns, unsaid it kind of did, but nothing changed. Um, Blackwater was still there. Eventually, they changed their T-shirts to a different company. Blackwater's not around anymore. People think Blackwater changed their name or nothing. It's not around anymore. It's a different, whole different deal. It's not. It's not the same anymore. It's not as good. It's not, it's, it's not as high quality individuals. Not to say they all were back then, or anything like that. But that time period when East Source Square happened, it was there was a team in contact every single day. It was just the height of the height. I mean, that brings me to, to another point in the war in general is like you you think in the beginning of a war the enemy would be at its strongest is that debatable now right so you got the invasion minimal americans died compared to a three a four a five a six a seven you think that would decrease yeah right over a thousand U.S. soldiers died in 07. Like more than 10 times of the invasion. Like dangerous fighting, offensive, both sides. It doesn't make any sense. It's just all politics. A lot of that due to the more the defensive nature and the unknowns of just working around. You don't know who's who in the mix. Was there a lot of confusion with that? Or is... In my opinion, that war was won when Bush said it was won. That was, you know, in 24 hours, we took out everything that flew or had armor on it. In three days, we took your major city. It was over. And then you had the insurgency. I got there one year later, like less than one year later, and I didn't get to fight a uniformed enemy that had any nuts. You know, that had right. It was just a guy on a cell phone peek out of the street, come back around, fire at us with an AK, go over here, change his clothes, get on a rooftop, shoot an RPG, and then walk across the street, smile at us with a newspaper. You know? In the middle of a city full of kids and everything else. It only takes like 30 minutes, and the market's back in order, and people are selling bread and shit. Wow. And then you're pissed off. Yeah. Who's who? And you see these fighting age males smiling looking at you and they're like smirking at you and stuff and you just want to do something and you can't All right um like i said when you saw square happened i uh my, i had another shooting two days before that on route irish i, I don't know if we got into that but uh then i was getting ready to go on leave then to the point where all my gear was turned in I think it was like a day, two days before you turn in your shit down, you just kind of let it relax and then go home. And my truck commander, who used to be the driver, he was the driver during the January 23rd deal. He's like, dude, I want you to go on this with us. We're going to buy, we're going to Baghdad International Airport. You know, and you have to run from Green Zone down Route Irish to their normal shit. And it didn't, it wasn't, to me, it wasn't hot it wasn't like dangerous like, why the fuck do you want me to go you gotta I'm done I'm, I'm playing Xbox or whatever it was and uh, so I went so I had to borrow a helmet from some Pope and then my buddy Jared I borrowed his vest and I'm skinny as fuck and his vest is too big for me and I couldn't even tighten it down enough and he bought it and one of those stupid Dragon skin? It wasn't dragon skin. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. It wasn't dragon skin. That shit was good. Mm. But that shit got so hot, those little discs started falling out. Really? From what I heard. And it was heavy as shit. It wasn't anything crazy. It was just green and cool looking or something. Right. Probably a predator vest or something. Um, so I borrowed his shit and went. And we were heading out and there's this one building... On our left, that they call the skeleton building den. It's all, I got pictures of it now, though. It's like all redone and shit. But uh, it was one building where you actually like unlock the turret and point the 240 at it and, and like guide the 240, and whoever's in it can see you fucking scanning it with your shits going down. And and it was, it was a stupid, it was taking some 
somebody, a congressman or some somebody stupid. To, uh, I'm not saying they're stupid. I'm just it wasn't like a mission to go right. solve the world's problems. They were going to shop at the airport, literally. Um, and I saw these guys up on the top floor, the top right floor. And this building is uh, like a skeleton. It's a skeleton building. It's just no windows, no nothing, just the floor. Like a construction of a building that hasn't had the walls up yet. Just the structure of it. So you can see through it completely. And the top right, um, if you're looking at it, the top right of the building, there's these guys up there. And I, I don't know if I knew how many then going that going towards Biop. But... Uh, it, what was funny to me, not that they were in the building, because there's an Iraqi checkpoint under the building, which are our allies under it. And then there's constant traffic down Route Irish. I mean, there's M1 Abrams and Bradleys and all kinds of shit going up and down it. Like they could stand a chance if they fired a rifle or anything from it. Um, they can clock off some IEDs or some shit, but they were dressed in the, their, their shirts and their pants were the same color as the interior walls of the building exactly like maroon like they would blend in but I saw them two or three of them and they were just sitting watching standing walking we go out and I tell my truck commander probably on the way to buy up we get to buy up and I tell him about it and I'm like dude I don't feel right about it they're, they're just dressing the same like trying to blend in with the interior walls of the building and they're standing they're just watching he's like keep an eye on, on the way back and um let me know keep that 240 on them and and we're running light cat which is one humvee behind the motorcade however many we have and the, the suburbans run a lot faster than the humvee and some of the drivers are stupid sometimes or they just lose communications don't realize how fast they're going if they're going 60 or 65 they're going to lose us right. five or ten miles an hour at a time and of course they're fucking by the time we're there for hours and by the time when we're coming back by about the time we're coming up to that building or short of it they we're losing and we're you know there's a bigger gap between us and them which ended up being a blessing I think um so I'm starting to unlock my turret and orient my 240 to the building. And they're, like I said, they're just, it they felt like slow motion. They were just, there's a guy kneeling with an AK-47, just, just firing away. You know, we're, we're coming back towards the green zone. He's over here to my right. I'm yelling out contact three o'clock. I think I said three o'clock, probably just said contact. Maybe. <laughs> and he's he doesn't see me because I'm way behind, like a, like three of the same vehicle looking things start going by. And he thinks, OK, there's that whole package from my understanding. And he's just firing an AK. And I see two more guys in there and they're moving around a lot. And I can I know one of them's got an RPG and he's starting to, like, get set up or will do whatever he's doing. And. There's enough gap in between us. I'm orienting, orienting my uh, 240 to the uh, to where they're at, yelling out contact, and I take it off safe and squeeze into the trigger, and I'm down on my sights for a minute. You I mean, think I'm just shit hot? I know what I'm doing, but I'm like trying to look down my sights, and I'm shooting from a car, you know, from a vehicle. It's going 50, 50, 55 miles an hour, and. I squeeze in the trigger and then I immediately get up from it. You can't really just look down the sight like that. And uh, I can see my tracers going. And I can see this one guy. I'm just pretty much focused on the one guy shooting the small arms at the, at the motorcade. And he looks at me from the other angle. He looks at me. Finally, he kind of looks over at me and then like double takes and looks at me again and starts to swing my way. And I'm already like fire hosing my tracers. I can see him every fifth round. I was like, and I'm just, I just kind of get up and just kind of move it towards him. And I just start laying rounds into there as we're going by. And I'm pretty sure 
my truck commanders yelling, you know, to calling the contact up to hire. And, um, I don't let off the trigger. I'm just shooting into that box of that room until I get to a point where I can't see them and I'm like in the lower, lower part of the road. So I'm shooting up into a building and I can't see them anymore cause I'm lower. So I'm, I don't know if subconsciously or if I just accidentally, I start shooting and I see the ceiling of the room and I can see some of the rounds coming, at least the tracer rounds coming, hitting the ceiling and coming down into the room. And not knowing if that's doing anything or not. But uh, we get to a point where we're caught up in traffic. We can't move anywhere. And I'm just fucking billboard in my way, this huge billboard for a phone company or, or something. And I have enough awareness about me to know that there's an Iraqi checkpoint below. I don't know if they're going to start shooting at me because we don't look exactly like a military motorcade. We're different. Um, and I don't know how long we're going to be able to move or if they're going to shoot through that same billboard and hit me, you know, or and I'm looking all around me, seeing if grass is coming up or, or whatever. My right rear, which I didn't know at the time, but good really good friend of mine he had cracked the window with a saw and he was engaging as well uh he had a malfunction and had to fucking fix all that obviously <laughs> right then but uh it felt like we were caught up in traffic forever it caught up long enough i started shooting through the billboard where i thought they would be hoping that i wasn't too low or whatever to fuck with the uh the ips down there and I can remember before, like in the middle or before that or something, I can remember like, like I said, like M1 Abrams going the opposite direction and shit. Thinking, are they going to engage? Are they going to engage me? You know, what, what's, what's going on? But uh, we finally get moved. Well, no, we get stopped. I'm shooting and I stop shooting to see how many rounds I got left. And I open the feed tray cover real quick. I have two rounds left on the belt. So we got like, you know, 200 rounds in a can. So I just sweep them off and, I, and there's another can right next to it in the mount. And I reload. So I know I shot 198 rounds into there. I guess if it's exactly 200 rounds. But, uh, and then we get moving again. But it turns out, I got, I got an award for that from Blackwater, but, uh, I don't think I would have, but there were, <laughs> I don't know why I'm laughing. <laughs> Behind this building was, it's written in the citation, um, a certain special operations unit was behind the building and they were throwing up BS-17 panel. You know what that is? Mm -hmm. Just like orange panels and shit because they were getting all the ricochets from the ceiling coming oh, in wow. the outside the building. Hitting, I don't know if it's hitting their trucks or coming around them. But at some point, if they're throwing up VS-17 panels, they knew it was like friendly fire or, or something. But uh, so they knew what was going on. They knew it was a coalition force or, or a private company in their best interest or whatever. So they had went up after we left or while we were leaving and cleared that. I don't know if they talked to the IPs before, but they went up and found, finally got to where those guys were. And, and found them up there but the funny thing was is was that the same or a separate incident from the one you're talking about earlier this is separate <clears throat> wow so just very similar situation in some ways yeah, yeah. um <clears throat> and what's funny is that in the band we were supposed to go oh, a friend of mine knew that some of them guys in that unit um that's not how we found out about this they had coordinated with our base and figured this out but um we were supposed to go play in the band <laughs> over at their compound. Did that get mixed? I didn't get to go because I was on a cat <laughs> and I wasn't allowed to leave the camp for some reason, but they went. Um, anyway, they had confirmed, they saw, they saw it. There was three guys dead up there and whether from me or my buddy. Um, but yeah, it worked out. I don't know what they were thinking. They found six multiple RPG rounds and RPG launcher. And um, I think it was just one AK-47 that guy was shooting. 
when you think about how dumb that is, like Route Irish, there's just constant coalition traffic on there. Like I said, Abrams and Bradleys, and right. it's like, what are they? I don't know. But that was two days before um, the sort of square thing. At, right before we got into the checkpoint, a TST team, I don't know if it was the same team, but they were, they heard what had happened and they were on their way out to help. So I'm here coming in, up in the turret, you can see everything. And they're double turrets, two gunners in each vehicle. Most of them had two, I think. And uh, they had radio contact, obviously, but I think I was just fucking amped up. I'm like, no, no, don't go. It's like, <laughs> RPG, don't, <laughs> don't go. And uh, I want to say they just busted you and came back, but um, yeah. You say you got awarded for that with Blackwater? Yeah, I got That's where those come from. That's where I got That's that from. What, yeah. So, yep. I love the just straight business aspect of that. <laughs> Killed a lot of coyotes with that thing. <laughs> For sure. A couple of deer, but. Walking the whole grip, huh? <clears throat> I, I put the grip on there, I think. Or the tape. The tape. <clears throat> to be cool or whatever. <laughs> to be cool. I actually had it all wrapped up for uh, predator hunting. Yeah. Um, I had a thermal scope on it. Um, one of the cheaper ends of those. But yeah. Is that the one you had like the little battery pack thing for and everything you're showing me? Battery pack? I, I was thinking you had like a battery pack or something that like had taped to the stock or plugged in. I may be mixing stories maybe. with somebody else. Probably, <laughs> maybe. No, no, no. It had a, its own like this stupid like the CR one two threes in there or okay. whatever. But yeah, I've killed a lot of stuff with that. Hmm. And I got my magazine back from you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have been single loading to kill coyotes with that. <laughs> got a mag now. Yeah. Couldn't buy another mag? I just, I'm not, I'm irresponsible. I just don't do it. What kind of rifle is that too? 22 Magnum. Kill some coyotes with that. Well, don't forget it. <laughs> yeah. It'll be another year and a half before you get it if you miss it tonight. That's pretty much Iraq for you, I guess. Yeah. You ever meet the prince while you're over or with the company? Eric Prince? Yeah. One time, he came over and talked to us. This was before the... I hate that New York Square thing happened. Everything was, it was such a... Everything was going great. Whatever happened, you know, we were doing a great job. We never had a client with a scratch on them. We lost a lot of guys, you know, but it was very, very effective, very cost effective, very, you know, gave a lot of guys really good jobs and um, effective. Everybody used way more discretion than people think they did, you know, not any less than any military unit, I don't think. Right. No, it's easy to judge on it, man. Look at law enforcement today and same thing. We know. had a lot more free reign. We could, you know keep people farther away from us if we wanted to you know what i mean yeah but that's just per the state department we could they didn't want to die so right. we were protecting them we could throw water bottles at cars and break their windows out i mean get away from me i don't know who you are you know there were some people that abused that a little bit you know not as much as anybody thinks not as much as i've seen in the military you know I'm not saying the military is bad. I'm not. That's not what I'm getting at. It's just it's war. Yeah. Everybody's got their opinions. And fuck their opinions. Go there and tell me how many hands they can have tied behind their back and still be effective. Yeah. Figure no. that out. No, that's a fair assessment. It'd be great if it was, I guess, the Revolutionary War and you're just standing lined up shooting at each other and everybody's cleared out of the battlefield. This is not like that. Right. It's not. Not the furthest thing from that. When you get shot at from a building... And you're in the greatest military the world has ever known, and you got the people you love the most with you. You want to go from floor to floor and find that guy, or you want to just demolish the building? What do you want to do? What would you do if you if nobody cared? What would you do? What would you do? Let me get this Apache over here and just not for lack of care of who's in the building, but I just know the people standing to my left or right better. You know? Yeah. 
But why is that so hard to comprehend for some people? I don't know. Because they're not there, I guess. I don't remember one time I was getting shot at during or uh, down Haifa Street. People know. I don't. It's kind of a bitch moment for me. I was turning gunning and driving down Haifa Street. We, were, we shouldn't have been going this way, and we needed to turn around and come this way. And it was just like busy everywhere. And then we make this left down Haifa. It was a bad time to be on Haifa Street. I didn't know anything about it, but I think some people would know Haifa. Don't go down Haifa. But uh, big, tall apartment buildings and things. And it was just like busy, busy, busy. And then you make this left and it's like, there's mm-hmm. nobody there. I'm like, fuck, what the hell is this? And then I hear, bow, 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 bow. And we're the only truck, just fast cat. And obviously you flinch and then you look where it's coming from. And by the time I flinched and looked, I was getting shot at from the right. And then I flinched and look right, and I'm getting shot at from the left. And it was like over and over down this gauntlet. And then we had to turn around and come back, and it was the same team, the same same thing back. I never felt like a bitch so much <laughs> coming back down. And it was like boom, oh, boom, oh. <laughs> they never, not a hole in the truck, not a mark in the truck, and I don't know what I couldn't. I never saw anybody. Wow. Uh-huh. Was. A, it's a wimp moment. You ever want to go back? Where? Getting back involved in the private side or? Yeah, I do. <clears throat> yeah, I liked it a lot. I liked the bullshitting with friends and um, most of the time nothing was going on. I mean, nobody likes it to go on. I mean, it's for real. Uh, I don't know. I couldn't imagine going back to Iraq, I guess. I, I really don't even know what the fuck is going on there now. I have no idea. Nobody report. Nobody gives a shit, it seems like. There's nothing. I remember seeing cities that we were holding in the army over there in Jalula and City, these no-name cities on the Iranian border. And and I remember seeing that the these insurgents had taken them. And I was like, well, fuck all this shit. I mean, uh, it's all politics now. You can't, you can't win that. All right. Yeah, I, I always want to go back. My kids, I don't. I don't want to go back because my kids and my wife and everything else. And not from the danger. I, I think I'll always be all right. I just feel like I always would be all right. <clears throat> but just being gone, you miss little things. Even if I am only going to be gone a month or sixty days or whatever, a lot happens in, in those amount of days with the three year old or yep. nine year old. A lot. You know that from being home. You know. Every day, like I, my youngest daughter will do something just in a couple seconds that'll just blow your mind or just make you laugh. Or, yeah. And that kind of stuff, you know? Um, but yeah, I always want to go back. I always, I probably will be going back. I'm uh, trying to. Try to Afghanistan. Do. Afghanistan. Yeah. I was in Baghdad for five years, or I mean Iraq for five years, Baghdad most of the time, and um, I was in Afghanistan for four years right after that. So, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and twelve. You did some work in the hurricane stuff too, right? One of the islands down south? Puerto Rico, yeah. Yeah. I went down to some security work. There wasn't that much need for security. There was a lot of guys that went down there. I ended up running into the guys I work with overseas um um everybody had a different client that they were protecting and the guy was, was a cool dude um we ended up just kind of working together there was no need for protection from crime or anything like that there, there's some crime there i did get carjacked there what yeah seriously i did <laughs> like on the job no the one week my wife came down i got carjacked with my wife and her friend Walking back from the beach, had my shoes in my hand, the stuff I needed in the Jeep, Ooh. and they surrounded the Jeep. Were they armed? Yeah. There wasn't anything I could do. Uh-huh. Unless I banked on them not doing anything, you know, and I had my wife with me, and we were drinking and stuff. So it was like 50 yards from the house I was renting. So I'm like, here's the keys. Get out of the car, girls. Let them take it. 
left the phone in there, checked the car, to a place in Bayamon, went down there, planned on going into these projects, and then talked to these cops, and like, no, we don't go into these projects unless we have 15 special police. I'm like, all right, <laughs> we got the Jeep back and stuff, but... Yeah, I went down there. I was only going to be down there a few months or a month or two months. And all the security guys gradually went home. And I ended up staying, helping with the guy I was protecting, run this program, refueling generators and doing maintenance on generators uh, all over the island. We had like 60 guys, Puerto Ricans working f for him. And uh, ended up helping run that program until he left. And I ran it for a couple more weeks before... Yeah, that program was over and then I formed my own company and got a small contract and put some more Puerto Ricans to work down there. Great people down there, man. Hard working, intimidatingly sharp people. Got some lifelong friends out of it and uh, put some more people to work and um, like 16 guys made some money and then tried to uh, get a bigger contract and Ended up getting hosed on that deal, but it was a cut through that disaster workers just there's some the worst of the worst work doing that kind of stuff. It's kind of funny. Yeah. But yeah, it was a good experience. I love Puerto Rico. But yeah. That was the last I've been home over a year from that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's the goal? What's the end game? I don't know. After want? Iraq, I went to Afghanistan for four years with EW and Academy, and U.S. Training Center, whatever they want to call it. Czechs always said Blackwater, but um, over there was a lot different than Baghdad. It was a lot more controlled. You didn't, there wasn't any fighting really, indirect fire and stuff like that, but uh. I was on the ambassador's detail. I was advanced team for the ambassador's detail. I was a shift leader for the uh, the um, tactical support team. I guess they called it over there. I worked in the tactical operations center. And then my last year, I worked for a different company and on an anti-terrorism assistance gig. And we did, um, we trained President Karzai's close protection and uh, the vice president's protection details. Um, Were those air quotes? Yeah. Vice <laughs> presidents. I don't even know how many there were. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think if I can say what the organization was. I don't know if I can or not, but it was... Uh, you can leave that out. It wasn't that cool. It was just... The most basic training you can imagine. I mean, we started out these guys telling them where the trigger was on a gun. And then wow. all the way into it, like advanced SWAT team stuff, counter surveillance. And, um, you know, I taught the counter assault team. Um, their, their talk operations there. Uh, what else? When we taught basic stuff, I mean, two man bounding drill. We taught uh, room entry. I mean, these guys, we got these guys really good. We did all the sim round stuff, you know. Uh, protection of national leaders course is like the main course we did. It was the only resident program for the anti terrorism stuff. And in the beginning, before I was there, there was, they were, they were, this organization was uh, Karzai's detail. They protected him directly. Supposed to be about an eight-year program. It's kind of an exit strategy. We were training. We were training the trainer. Right. We trained them fully out from yep. years of trigger to the advanced, advanced stuff. Advances they let us advance, and then, and then we trained all those key people to train all that train the trainer. So an exit strategy where we could leave and they could self-sustain. I think it's still going on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. But, um, you looking at possibly going back? Do you, do you, do you plan on staying around here? Like what do what are you going to do? With well, I've been working with my furniture and lighting business now and, uh, I like it a lot. Uh, doing antler chandeliers and I don't know how I got into that, but, 
Woodworking, big uh, live edge table, single slab, like walnut stuff and rare wood stuff. And you know, I've done quite a bit of stuff. Mostly I work alone. Um, I got my real estate license. I've done a little bit of real estate. And that's tough to get into. It's tough to get a start doing that. Yeah. I'm not much of a salesman, so you got to be, you know, that kind of a deal. Um, I think I'm going to do some more contracting. But, uh, yeah. Not so many long rotations, I don't think, but. Well, they sound like they keep getting shorter and shorter. You're in those 60-60s, 45s and stuff like that. A lot of guys are getting stuff for their back. Actually, yeah. It seems like a lot of guys are traveling home too often. It's driving them insane. But I, I don't know. know. That short aspect sounds nice to me. From 06 to 2011, I was doing 90-30s pretty much all the time. Right. So Seemed very standard at that time. The last year, I was doing 90-90s with ATA. Yeah. And that was good. I wanted to stay longer, actually. I didn't want to be gone so long so I could make some more money. Right. Stay sustained in the training and, you know, stay in front of my interpreters and stuff like that. Work with some good guys over there, some good um, Afghans. You know, I have some really good friends over there, which was a good transition. You know, you, you get to fighting in a war and stuff, and you're like, oh, I don't like Muslims or this and that. Right. You get to know a lot of them, and they're, you love them, you like them, you die for them despite your differences and religious beliefs or whatever. But, um, yeah, but there, there's not a lot of, it's not like it used to be. Um, mission wise, is I mean, I don't think, I think there, there's a lot of good contracts out of there. And, um, I didn't come from a special operations background, so a lot of them tier one, you know, like if you're a Green Beret or Navy SEAL or something, there's probably some cool contracts out there, but, you know, if you're airborne infantry, it doesn't matter how much contracting you've done, you're nine years of contracting, you can't get into some of that. So it's still a, you're still an airborne guy at that point then? What? Like you you put in nine years of contracting and that doesn't raise the bar or something? No, it never does. Dang. No. That's wild. You got any advice for anybody wanting to get into it? Guys getting out, looking for other work. Go to war in the infantry. Five years as a ranger and go special operations in some sort of way or another. I wish I would have done that. Yeah. I got out. Um, I, when I got out from Korea, I wish I had just stayed in and, and did that. I was going through pre-ranger. I was getting ready to go through pre-ranger in the 82nd Airborne. Um. They were picking a couple guys every few months or a couple months. And then the trade towers got hit. And then I got the person around saying, I'm going to Korea. I could have stayed in. I could have said, oh, I want to do this or that. But I want to go out and run the streets and drink and have fun. <laughs> that, was the, <laughs> and that was the main thing. And the infantry was different. You were always like segre segregated off. You're not around women, nothing. It was like, a, especially in Korea. It was, it was like a, like you're a prisoner. It was kind of weird. I don't know how to explain it. Um, but yeah, that would be my advice is if you want a contract, don't, I don't know, go in the military, do your time, do a tour, find a war, go fight it. <laughs> I guess, <laughs> I don't know. That works well. I don't know. I'm not the one to give advice I don't think no worries well it's probably about that time you're gonna have to roll out of here aren't you sure <laughs> yeah it's 11 yeah dude it's always a pleasure man thanks yeah, for coming yeah. in I appreciate it I'm not it. the best spokesman but <laughs> I hope I didn't miss anything or said everything right no I'm sure it's good good for a lot of guys to listen to and uh I got one more thing I need you to do what is that one second, I'll be right back. Because I don't think I'm prepared. There's a marker. I need you to sign. Sign at their table. And put EP1 somewhere next to it so everybody knows your episode 1. And if they look at a signature and it looks interesting, they know which episode to go to when they're watching. 
Sign it and put wherever EP1. you want. Yeah, EP one. Sign it and whatever you want. <clears throat> okay. Like a signature, or you want it legible? It's up to you, man. They're gonna find you off EP one. <laughs> <laughs> Got some lipstick. Uh, want to add a little more to it? <laughs> Again, thanks, brother. No problem. Always good seeing you. I want to see that. Like, I guess, how does how it work? What do you do? It's going to go on the internet, on the old mighty interwebs. And, uh, I'm just full out. Yeah, I hope just I full out. Anything weird. No, you probably too said much. a lot of weird stuff. Probably said way too much. Got a lot to worry about. I guess not. I'm like, I'm not. <laughs> Obviously, more than likely, someone. Same thing. You know what the funny thing was? Let's turn that off. Is that off? It's about to be. Guys, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess that camera went out. Uh, Again, thanks for watching. Make sure you like, hit that subscribe button. Make sure you hit the little bell icon to the far right. That way you get notifications when we post. This is going to be a new part of the, the Armor's Fix. It's the Armor's Fix or TAF podcast. So we'll be bringing on many, many more guests. Again, thank you, Tommy. It's awesome having you on today. And uh, we're going to shut these cameras off and uh, continue the stuff you guys can't hear. Anything you want to say? Last words? Um, this is your guy right here. That's the camera. That's the guy. The whole time that yep. was it. What's well, this one here? You talking? That's in that's there. me. And then there's this one over here. Is that one on too? Yeah, it has a little shut off problem tonight. Technical difficulties for uh, night number one, but it's now live. Huh. So yeah. Oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Final words. There I was. No shit. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect, man.